post order for three pounds ninety five made payable to BBC Education to <laughs> it goes as someone who adores the ballet I have always been in awe of the dedication skill and creativity of great dancers I know I'm only one of many who have long admired Dame Alicia as a supreme talent in this beautiful art I'm thinking of her on this special day and send her my love signed Diana I do love reading other people's mail. <laughs> now, Elisa, one of your dancing partners has special reason to remember you. During a world tour of 1954, you opened an Italian festival with him. The setting was idyllic on the seafront, backed by a beautiful countryside. You were about to dance the Sugar Plum Fairy in front of a packed and eager audience. There was an expectant hush, and you take to the stage. Alicia, that must be the only way when you dance of the rhythm and the music of the train. He's flown from his home in Paris to be with you tonight, Milorad Miskovic. <laughs> Milorad, tell us about this train of events. Oh, it was the wonderful evening because uh, in Nervi, the garden of the Nervi, it was the festival, it was the beginning of the festival, the yes. first performances for the concert, what I was lucky to be able to dance with you. Yes. And the end of the concert, just for the Nutcracker, because the backstage, it was the train passing. During all the performance, train didn't pass. But just in the moment when you had your wonderful, very delicate, musically by Tchaikovsky, Nutcracker yes. variation, yes. and the same as the choreography, in that moment the train pass and you have just to dance in the same rhythm as the train and the luck was it wasn't the kind of the train like today it was with the <laughs> like the music was the same <laughs> and it was the wonderful dancing the end you didn't know even if you finish or not you finish with enormous triumph asking after that and it was exactly on the music. <laughs> it was in the whole new ballet, couldn't it? Milorad, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Dame Alicia Markova, this is your life. And you were born in a two-room flat in Wilberforce Road in London's Finsbury Park on the 1st of December, 1910. And given the names Lillian Alicia Marks. Your father, Arthur, was a mining engineer, and your mother, Eileen, was an Irish girl who was training to be a nun when they met. There you are with your late mother. Your dad was a keen football fan and used to take you to watch the Arsenal. Did you enjoy that? I, I enjoyed it very much. And actually, I think, Michael, since then, I've, I've enjoyed football. Are you still an Arsenal fan? Yes, yes. Brave girl. <laughs> <laughs> no. At the age of eight, your parents send you not to Highbury, but to learn ballet at the Thorne Academy at the top of Muswell Hill. Did you always have a burning ambition to dance? No, actually, at the beginning, I, d I didn't have any ambition to dance. I'd seen Pavla and thought she was fantastic, but it never entered my head. And uh, I think the whole reason I went to dance was because I had <laughs> flat feet. <laughs> and weak legs <laughs> and so I was sent for exercise well flat feet or not you're soon way ahead of all the other girls in your class mm -hmm. at the age of nine you appear in a talent contest as a Turkish sultana and you win it hands down or, mm -hmm. or feet up this leads to a booking at the Strand Theatre where you're billed as a danseuse which is a grand title for a little girl you're the eldest of four sisters sadly the youngest bunny died only a few years ago when you were children, things at home were run fairly and squarely, everything equally shared out. Well, yes, but that didn't stop you stealing my sweets. It is your sister Doris, and with her your sister Vivienne, your niece Susie, your nephew Nigel, and your first great niece, 18 months old, Natasha. <laughs> Thank 
Bryce, now, Miss Askew, you were saying that Alicia had a sweet tooth. Oh, a very sweet tooth. When I was a baby, I understand she was given sweets to give me and let them herself. But she still does have a sweet tooth. All my chocolates I get as presents on occasions. I always know we'll find a home. And she's a real chocolate-holic. That's for the energy, I'm sure. That's what it is. Well, Alicia, shortly after your 10th birthday, you make your first paid appearance on stage, not in ballet, but in pantomime. Well, as a result of this, you are billed as the child Pavlova. You study with Princess Serafina Astavivia at a Chelsea studio. You do so well, you even appear at the London Palladium. But then tragedy strikes. Your father is swindled out of his money, and he dies shortly afterwards. Your mother is left virtually penniless. At 14, you have to go to work full time. The impresario Serge Diaghilev takes you on as the youngest member of his Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. Another member is told to chaperone you across the channel. Now, she's now one of your greatest friends, but at the time she was none too pleased with the job. In fact, she called you the little brat. At the age of 97, she recalls that incident for us, Dame Ninette de Valois. Hello, Elisa. How are you? The first time I met you, Elisa, was at Victoria Station. I remember I was at Diaghilev Russian Ballet. And I came to the station, and I suddenly heard our direct master say, De Valois, Ure De Valois. Oh, I thought, good heavens, they're going to ask me to look after the English Brett. <laughs> and it was you. And of course I was right. They brought you over to me with your governess, and from then on you trailed upon me for some years. You were a wonderful dancer. It was this incredible facility which brought you through all the things that are so much trouble to other people and the absolute adoration of Diaghilev for you. Most of them were very jealous of you, understandably, because you were a tiny little girl, but we hadn't got his foresight, and he saw what you were going to come to. So we had to put up with this adoration from him for you. Thank you, Nette Bravo. Now, you were little Lily Marks when you left for Monte Carlo. How did you become Alicia Markova? Actually, it was Diaghilev who, uh, shall we say, re renamed me. But uh, I didn't know until the actual program was printed. And I was a little disappointed because he'd only uh, left me with Alicia, which is my own name and removed S off the marks and put OVA on the end. Very simple, and I thought he would give me a wonderful Russian name. <laughs> well, little did you know, it would be That's part of history. <laughs> well, in the mid-1920s, you embark with the Ballet Russe on a life of constant touring. Your talent is regarded so highly, new ballets are written specially for you. You're still only 18, and Diaghilev plans to make you his prima ballerina, then suddenly he dies and the company is dissolved. You're back in England without work. The young choreographer Frederick Ashton gets you a job at the regal cinema Marble Arch, dancing between the films. Ashton also creates new ballets for you, which you perform at London's newly formed Ballet Club and at the tiny Mercury Theatre in Notting Hill Gate. <laughs> Do you remember how much you were paid for that? By the performance, and it was Sunday evenings, and I think eventually I had ten and sixpence in the old money. Uh, I was offered by Mim Rombert six and six, and I know Fred was also, but uh, six and six only paid for the ballet shoes in those days. And uh, the other four shillings, I had to have a cab home because we always finish so late. And the rest you could just waste. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the rest was me. But while you're collecting your ten and six at the ballet club, Ninette de Valois forms the Vic Wells Company. You become the star of Sadler's Wells. <laughs>
For eight years you refused lucrative offers from abroad because you want to help build up a British company. You made history by being the first British ballerina to dance the great classics, Giselle, Swan Lake, and the Nutcracker. In 1935, with Anton Dolin, you formed the Markova Dolin Company. You toured the lengths and breadths of Britain, performing in town halls, boxing arenas, even Bellevue Zoo. You auditioned hundreds of young people. One girl was only 18 when you commissioned her to write a ballet, but it was certainly different. Some people thought I'd gone dotty, Alicia, when I said I didn't want you to do this ballet on point. Director and choreographer, Wendy Toy. Uh -huh. So, Wendy, you, you knew what you wanted, all right? Oh, I think so, but with Alicia's help, yes. You see, I wanted, I was very interested in contemporary dance, and uh, most of Alicia's fans and admirers weren't so keen on the idea of that, but she encouraged me, and she agreed to do it not on point, so it was wonderful for me. And I just want to say how grateful I am and how much I love you and... Well, I admire you. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, in 1938, you decided to pick up the gauntlet and try your luck in America. You signed a three-year contract, and you opened at the Metropolitan Opera House, New York. You're back in Britain between seasons when war breaks out. You volunteer for war work, but your contract forces you to return to America. At the Hollywood Bowl, you break all attendance records. Stravinsky writes a ballet for you, and you star on Broadway. You were a star, but I remember you sleeping on the pavement. He's phoned in from New York, choreographer and director, Freddie Franklin. <laughs> So, Freddie, the star was on the pavement. Well, yes, at one moment. But you know, um, it wasn't all glamour in the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, as Alicia well knows. We did 110 cities in six months, and during that six months, there were many, many one-night stands, and we got very, very tired. Well, one night, we were waiting in a bus station for the bus, and I turned around looking for Alicia, and she's fast asleep on the floor with a hat box for a pillow and a coat over her, having a wonderful time, and we're all exhausted. And then another thing I must say on the one-night stands, baths were at a premium, if you remember, Alicia. <laughs> and Alicia would then go to a very nice hotel and take a very nice room and order a lot of extra towels and then have her friends from the Court of Ballet come and take a very much needed bath. <laughs> Believe me, we all needed them too. Alicia, what a lovely time we had together. Do you remember it was non-stop? Yes, yes. The whole company for two or three hours, you see, uh, from lunchtime. Um, well, it was the only thing it, it, we could do. And they used to call it the army game. <laughs> Maybe it did happen in the army, I don't know, but anyway, <laughs> well, we were well, clean. Alicia, it was yes. lovely to be here. Well, thank, thank you okay. very much. Right. Bless you. Oh, okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you. This. Yeah. In 1947, you visit the Philippines, the first artist to perform there since before the war. You dance on improvised stages, the backing sometimes just a piece of sackcloth lit by army searchlights. Conditions were so harsh that when you left, you weighed just six stone. Back in England once again, you decide to break new ground and you take over the Empress Hall and Haringey Arena. Insisting prices are kept low, you bring ballet to a whole new audience. Instead of champagne cocktails in the crush bar, it's hot dogs all round. Conditions are fairly primitive backstage. But I think you were able to make yourself fairly comfortable in a manner of speaking. Former prima ballerina of the Royal Ballet and later artistic director of the London Festival Ballet, Dame Beryl Gray. <laughs> Beryl, she knew how to look after herself. Well, Dame Alicia is wise and experienced. I first saw Alicia dance 1935, 
as Giselle in the Saddler's Wells Theatre. What an inspiration for a six-year-old you were. <laughs> what I appreciate so much about you is your care and your kindness to other artists. You know, you helped me so much when I was in trouble at Covent Garden. I didn't know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> Dame Alicia gave me her opinion and advice, which I took, and I've never regretted. May I say thank you for your farewell performance in London, as Giselle, which I shall never forget, a role that you have made your own. <laughs> thank you, Dame Barrow. Thank you. Thank you. Now, in 1950, <laughs> you and Dolin form another company which you name the Festival Ballet, now the English National Ballet. One critic described you at the time as ethereal, light as thistledown. That may be so, Alicia, but no one could have achieved so much without iron determination. It's Ned Sherrin. <laughs> Ned, tell us about the iron. Well, it, my collaborator, Carol Brahms, was a lifelong friend and admirer of Alicia's, and uh, she filled me in very soon on the remarkable genius and the remarkable determination. And in a, in a memoir, uh, which I was reading the other day, um, wrote that um, she'd been... Uh, her heart was in her mouth one night, watching Alicia dance, and in the middle of the variation, uh, the ribbon of the ballet shoe uh, came loose, and she was watching in terror, afraid that uh, you were going to trip, but you managed the variation beautifully, and she went round afterwards and said how worried she'd been, and you presented her uh, with, the, with the shoe, and she says in a rather theatrical note in the memoir, I wonder where it is now, and when I was going through her effects, I found it neatly labelled and wrapped in tissue paper under two similarly labelled dresses that had begun to be belong to her, her great-grandmother. And I like to think that's a little metaphor for what you've contributed to the tradition of British dancing over this century. Oh. Ned, thank yes, you very much. Alicia, in 1960, you once again try something new. You perform with the great classical Indian dancer Ram Gopal. To do this, you painstakingly learn a whole new set of dance movements. Do you remember them? Oh, well, it's, it's an entirely different language, and you have to learn, you know, all the, this, and then the, uh, the lotus, and uh, this, and the little bees that fly around, and, uh, yes, I, I studied with him, oh, I forget how many weeks, so that I could do it correctly. I thought you'd given up performing. That was lovely. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> now, young people have always been uh, important to you, and you've taken time off to spend a month every year at the Yorkshire Ballet Seminars in Ilkley. Uh, we're going to Ilkley tonight to hear from director David Gale. Hello, Dame Alicia, and congratulations. You've been coming to teach at the Yorkshire Ballet Seminars at Ilkley College for 20 years. The students adore you and your classes have been invaluable. Here is David Johnson, last year's winner of the Markova Scholarship. Hello, Dame Alicia. I bet this is a surprise for you. We prepared something special just for you. And here is the winner of last year's mark of a prize, 13-year-old David Johnson.
Now, in 1963, you give up public performances and your services to ballet are recognized when you're made a dame of the British Empire. But within a few weeks, you take on yet another new challenge and become director of opera ballet at the Metropolitan Opera House New York and later professor of ballet at Cincinnati University. By 1977, you're back in London for a new production of Les Sylphides. At one rehearsal, a young man's dreams come true. Yes, since I was a little boy, I always wanted to dance with Markova. And then I did. He's flown from Australia to be with you tonight, international ballet star and director, Peter Schaufus. Peter, what happened? Good. Well, what really happened, you might not remember, but we were at the Donmar studio. Yes. And I'd been invited over to, to dance in the production of this movie. Yes. Mm. And uh, we stood there, and nobody else arrived, and we looked at the clock, we looked at yes. each other, you looked mm. at me, I looked at you. Yes. I looked back at you, you looked at your shoes, I looked back at you, <laughs> and you took your shoes off, and you said, well, we better get on with a young man, so yeah. you can learn that back. Ballet probably. Yes. No, I danced the ballet many times before that. And one thing I want to tell you is that you were much lighter than any of the other ballerinas or any ballerina I've ever danced with ever since. I love you. Peter Schatzers, thank you. Thank you. While you were with the Metropolitan Opera House, you helped the singers with their movements on stage. One of the many stars you worked with has become a close friend, together with her husband. They greet you now from their home in Sydney, Dame Joan Sutherland and Richard Bonning. Dear Alicia, we're very proud to be part of your celebrations. I don't know how much you realize I owe to you. You introduced me to ballet. I, in 51, I saw your Giselle, your Nutcracker, over and over again. I thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. We love you very much. And I too, Lucia, remember how you helped me with La Sonambula and uh, La Fille de Regiment, teaching me, doing the choreography for my little dance in the last act of Fee, and helping me very much with movement in that respect. All the best and much love. Thank you, Joan and Richard. Now, before I close this quite heavy book, I want to take you back to London in 1960 and the Prince's Theatre. You've never forgotten the star's kindness and his help as you were learning a whole new way of dancing. You've described it as one of the highlights of your career. Well, he is here too, the incomparable Ram Gopal. Dame Alicia Markova, this is your life. And next night on BBC One, a party with Lionel and Jean as time goes by. <laughs>